All right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today at Empower Us, hosted by Chronosphere. We're really excited to have this awesome panel here with us today. We're gonna be talking about imposter syndrome um, and kind of gonna go through everyone's ex various experiences. We'll have um, some questions and then they'll, for the panelists, and then there'll be time for Q&A with the audience as well at the end. So if you have any questions, make sure to write them on the little pieces of paper on your table and we'll go around and make sure we can collect them and pass them on to Heather who will be moderating the, the panel for us. So just quickly going through the agenda, kind of what I just said, but um, so we're gonna spend about 45 minutes doing the panel discussion and Q&A and then there'll be time at the end for everyone to kind of network, mingle, um, talk to the panelists, um, that sort of thing. So we'll be wrapping up at 5.45. And yeah, so now I will hand it over to, to Heather, Heather Joslin. She's a, a features editor at the News Stack, and she'll be moderating for us today. And I think you're going to take it from here. Going to take it away. Yeah. Um, thanks. Th thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Gibbs. Uh, welcome, everybody. I know that you're here um, because you're interested in our subject, which is not just imposter syndrome, but also how uh, women can carve out more influence. Women and non-binary folks can car carve out more influence in the tech industry. Um, and I know you're here because you're interested in that. And also you've submitted your vaccine card and your ID and your birth certificate and your mother's maiden name and, and all that sort of thing. So thank you for going through all that to, to be here today. Um, so. One thing, um, again, my name is Heather Joslin. I'm with the New Stack. I was previously with a uh, cloud native consultancy called Container Solutions, and um, I've uh, and um, I've learned a lot about the tech industry uh, in the last few years. And and one thing that I have learned um, is how few women and non-binary folks are in it, even though we are women are. Um, you know, half of the workforce more generally. Um, the, the latest Stack Overflow um, developer survey found that women make up just 5% of professional developers around the world. And in the US, um, they make up just over 9% of, of developers. That 9% that includes non-binary, um, non-gender conforming folks as well. Um, so that's pretty, pretty uh, you know, startling. And so what we want to do is talk to some some women who are in uh, women non-binary people who are in the tech industry, who can talk about what they see as not just the obstacles which we've, but how they deal with it and what they would recommend and um, and what and as we mentioned um, because of COVID it's a little trickier but we'd like you to um, if you want to write questions um, we're gonna we'll be gathering them and uh, we can we can answer questions at the end of our discussion. Um, if you have stories you want to talk to, uh, at the end, we'll have a little bit of networking. If you want to talk to people here about tell your stories, I'd be happy to hear your stories as well, and I'm sure our panel would as well. Um, but we won't be able to go around with a microphone um, like we, we have um, in, in the past and things like this. But um, we're really happy you're here, and I'm going to let have each of our panelists introduce themselves, starting with Sophia Vargas. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sophia Vargas. I am currently a program manager at Google in our open source programs office, which is a very generic title. So I prefer research analysts because it's a little bit more aligned to the work that I do in terms of looking at uh, market and industry trends, as well as looking at our contribution analysis and some of our systems data. Um, I've been in the tech industry for about 10 years now, pretty much since I graduated college. I started my career at Forrester Research, uh, eventually becoming an analyst covering the data center and infrastructure market, um, and then transitioned to Google three years ago. Colleen Call. Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday. It's Wednesday, right? OK. I am Colleen Call. I have been with the new stack for about a year and a half as their digital marketing manager media, whatever you want to call me. I'm an events and I handle the uh, podcast and live streams. I love my title, but I always get it wrong. So I am so sorry, <laughs> my apologies. But um, I've been in tech for about, hmm, about almost five years. And it, uh, before that I was in hospitality, but it's mostly marketing and storytelling. But when I got into tech, it was just one of the most amazing challenges. And it was in biotech and just working with software developers and uh, just you know, just getting in that community has just been wonderful. So when I got this opportunity with the new stack uh, about a year and a half ago, 
Um, I've just been amazed. This is the best company I've ever worked for, and the culture is awesome, and um, and it's very challenging. So that is me. If you want to know anything more about me, you can go on LinkedIn, or we can talk later. And um, I'm happy to be here. And Eleanor Sebastian? Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Eleanor. Um, I'm an engineering manager at Chronosphere, and I manage the platform team. So the platform team is everything about how users interact with the product. So we have support the web, the, the UI, uh, the CLI, the API, things like that. Um, Chronosphere is a metrics and observability company, but I uh, was a web engineer. So I came into to Chronosphere really knowing nothing about metrics and observability and data. And um, yeah, it was really challenging, and I'm excited to talk about it. <laughs> and uh, in for Aparna, um, uh, Dina, Dina Karen, um, <laughs> Karen. Uh, which, uh, who was not able to be here today, is Crystal Kirkland. Yes. Hi, my name is Crystal Kirkland. I am a product marketing manager at Arise AI, a machine learning company. Um, and I was a part of the initial crew at Arise. Um, my background lies at the intersection of humanity and technology from the School of Information at UC Berkeley. And I am a greenie to t tech. Um, I've only been in it for a year, so fresh eyes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Eleanor's volunteered to be the first, uh, take the first stab at our first question. Um, we're gonna just all get a chance to weigh in on this, on these questions. Um, what have you found to be the biggest obstacles to exerting influence in the organizations you've worked in and how did you deal with them? Yeah, great question. So I think, so I had a web background, right? I was building web apps and then I moved to Chronosphere which is all about data and observability and metrics and I really knew nothing. Um, and so I entered this team uh, last December, so coming up on a year, and I was like, okay, how do I exert influence on this team that I'm managing? And I was like, I, you know, I know nothing. <laughs> so where do I even begin? So it sort of really started with like, okay, well, what's, what does success look like? So like, what do I need to do? Um, and like, what's achievable? And I think at first it was like, oh, I need to ramp up on everything metrics related and Prometheus and alert manager and all these things. And I know nothing, it's so overwhelming, but it's, it was really like, if Chronosphere has anything, it is a wealth of experts in this space. And I do not need to be an expert in that space. And it's sort of like delegating that responsibility mm -hmm. and that, um, and like sort of my ramp up into this space to my team. And so that's been um, just sort of making like what I thought was a failure in my uh, skills as sort of delegating that to the team and having them ramp me up. And then really being clear about like, what do I need to be successful and what's realistic? Like, I don't need to be an expert in this space to be successful as a manager. I can focus on what I am passionate about, which is people and culture and process and building a business that is inclusive and fun and yeah. um, a work-life balance. And so that's what I am good at. And that's what I'm an expert in and sort of can ramp up on the other things as I go. So that's sort of how I overcame that obstacle is just being really realistic about what I could do. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have thoughts about obstacles, what the biggest obstacles they've had to overcome? in the workplace? Well. <laughs> <laughs> what a meaningful looks being exchanged here. Well, I mean, I mean, if we're talking about challenges and, 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 and having that, I don't know if we are going through imposter syndrome, but I mean, when I got the opportunity with Newstack and even before that with uh, QI, a biotech company, like you said, I, I wasn't an expert. I know what, Sorry, I know what my what my skills were, but I'm like, well, okay, well, can I actually do this job? I mean, Eleanor's right. I mean, you don't have to like overthink the whole process because there are experts and there are so many people if you put your mind to it and have that mindset that are willing to help you, and um, and it helps. And uh, but you have to have that mindset and you have to to be positive in that mindset and not just don't beat yourself up about it. But having that influence, because most of the time, they want to learn something from you. <laughs> Especially, I, I, I thought it was really interesting that some of the software engineers that I thought were like way you know, smarter than I am, and, and, and they wanted to learn more about what I did. So it's like a give and take. So, and you, you can have that influence, uh, regardless of where you're, where you're from or where your background is. I think it's worth noting, too, that um, just one thing I've known, I mean, cloud native is such, uh, technology is so new 
And I mean, Kubernetes is like six years old or something like that. I mean, it's so nobody knows everything yet. <laughs> and, and just That's like to keep enough. that to keep that in mind is is help. I have found helpful. But but what about um, well, let's um, let's talk a little bit about imposter syndrome. Uh, first of all, has anyone has anyone uh, experienced imposter syndrome or felt imposter syndrome at some point? Wow, it's almost quite a, quite a lot of people. So um, I, I tweeted this more. I tweeted today um, that last night I was scrolling through Twitter before I went to sleep like you do. And um, somebody uh, had posted, like, all the wrong people have imposter syndrome, which I thought was kind of profound. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, so, um, Sophia, you said you would take this, this one. What advice would you give about, about avoiding that feeling, um, especially if you're, if you're somebody who is, you know, if you're not one of, one of the, the guys? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of an hard to completely avoid, especially if you're walking into a new role or a new position. Um, I guess for me in my career, it really hit me early on. Um, I was at Forrester, and I became an analyst after being a researcher and growing expertise in a topic. And as a 25-year-old out of college, I was put in the room with people that were twice my age and did not look like me. Um, and there was this moment of like, you're the expert and you don't really look like you're the expert. And there's kind of this judgment, um, assuming that like, how, do you, how can you tell me how to do my job better if you clearly have only been alive for half as long as me <laughs> and never worked in the industry? Um, so that was definitely a, a, bit of, a bit of an intense feeling where you just don't, you have to develop confidence in yourself. Um, and I think what, what really helped was I had a colleague who sat me down and was like, you know, the space that you're covering, you're covering the data center market, you've just spent the last two years learning everything you possibly can about this space. Like, you are guaranteed to know something that is gonna be new for these individuals, even though they've been in it. Um, and so just be confident in what you've learned. And I, I mean, I think maybe not everyone's approach, but I, I just would get really nervous about it, so I would just kind of just throw as much information at people as I could come up with, just as a way to finally get something that was new for them. And once you, once they figure out that yes, you know something that they don't know, then the ba the balance shifts. It becomes a conversation. They start listening to you. You start talking about it versus just trying to get their attention. So it was a lot of it was just being comfortable in in my own knowledge. And I think I'd say for anyone in the room who's feeling this, if you do your research, you do your work to really become an expert in the thing you are talking about, you are gonna know you are gonna know more than you think you do, and you have to you have to believe it and be confident in yourself. Anyone? And I think like the you be confident in what you know and be confident in your perspective. Like you are self identified greenie to tech. <laughs> and that new perspective is fresh and it's important and valid. And you sometimes raise a lot of things that you know, experts or more senior people um, forget about. So it's definitely about what you know and definitely about your perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like imposter syndrome can feel like this multi-dimensional just weight on your shoulders of, you know, you don't look the part or you're too young or like your gender doesn't fit. And very often I feel like I get lost in that and then I, I lose sight of my knowledge and my expertise, and I have to come home to me and my knowledge and sit with it and be like, okay, actually, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of smart. I can like figure this out, and I am capable. And talking to other people especially helps so much because it feels like such like an individual thing, but we all experience it. And I remember talking to one of my mentors, and she was like, everyone experiences imposter syndrome, and very, you are likely not the person, the, since, since everyone experiences it, you're very likely not the person to be the imposter. Like, get out of that mindset and just keep moving forward and it may feel Sisyphean, but at the end of the day, like you'll look back and be like, wow, I accomplished so much. And um, yeah. yeah, 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 that's it, that's all I got. <laughs> Like we can't all possibly be the imposter. Like some, yeah, exactly. <laughs> some of us have got to be, you know. Some, somebody, there's got to be some real, some real. Um, Probably realistically <laughs> speaking. Yeah, exactly. So, Colleen, did you, you want to weigh in on? Oh, I think I mentioned it before because yeah, yeah. I 
yeah. No. But it's the same. Yeah. What, you, know, you have to be in your mindset. You have to have, like you said, you have to have confidence in yourself that you know what the hell you're doing. And, um, and that's all on you. And, if, and then you get the feedback from um, your colleagues. Yeah. And you just try and thrive and make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Crystal, do you want to take this next one? How do you feel support? How do you find support amongst other women and, and other people within your organization and amongst allies in the organization? And how do you how do you support them yourself? Absolutely, yeah. So I think backtracking, thinking about my experience as a woman in STEM and just in life, I feel like <laughs> women are very often pitted against each other, yep. especially in like these niche fields where it feels like there's only one spot for the token woman. And so if you're in it with other women, um, then you have to fight for it. And I feel like the first step is creating an environment where you don't feel like you're fighting for a single spot or two spots in an organization. And in fact, where it's open to women and to diverse ideas and thoughts. And like at Arise, for instance, we have um, a concerted hiring effort to hire women and to keep that in mind. And we also have like ladies of Arise where we talk to each other like on a daily basis of like things that we think of like imposter syndrome and just keeping that open dialogue of like we're here together to help each other and not to be pitted against each other. And that, that like very mindset of like feeling like you have a team and that you have a spot and not only that you have a spot, but that you're encouraged to welcome others into your team or your organization has helped so much. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think too, like we talked a little bit last time about uh, building confidence and like just being confident in yourself and that's how you overcome some of these things. But I think with the community, yeah. with your team, that helps build confidence when that just doesn't come naturally. Right. Is that you just sort of feed off the confidence from your peers and the people and people who are you know are your allies. <laughs> exactly. That you can like trust fully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then feel like you can be completely vulnerable and feel safe in that vulnerability. Yeah. I mean I think there's there's definitely an element of just supporting each other. Um, and being the, the woman who sat me down and said, you know this, and that was how she was able to allow me to grow in my own role because someone else that wasn't myself was confirming that, yes, in fact, you can do this, you can do this job. <laughs> um, and so there's an element of, of just support verbally, either directly or in meetings. Sometimes it being, um, I moved into a new role recently and I just, notice that my, my manager and the teams around me are incredibly promotional of my work internally where I came from a position before of always having to self-promote uh, in terms of saying, hey, this is me, this is what I do, are you interested, can we work together? Um, and then finding a new role where the team around me was actively promoting my work, pointing it back to me and putting me in touch with others, either internally or externally networking. And it, it was, I mean, I didn't know that was a thing before. I mean, I did, but I didn't experience it before. And it really kind of changed um, my mindset of how, um, I don't know, just knowing that you're on a team that supports you or you have people around you that support you. So now that I've experienced that, I know it's sort of on me to make sure that I am being supportive toward my peers and toward women uh, and folks that are younger than me in their career, that they, they need that support, they need that confidence, they need someone else who's going out there who has a bigger network and can bring them into the conversation because they have that already built. And that's how I got where I was able to move on in my career and I, I owe that to others that are just developing. What are some of the concrete ways that you can support someone else in, like, to promote their ideas or promote their, um, like, uh, impact? In, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Their impact. There you go. I think. Oh, go, ahead. Hope, go ahead. Like, what, what? Yeah. What would you do if you, you know, for a colleague who you wanted to? Yeah. What's an example of? <laughs> well, I think mentorship is huge. Well, so I personally have mentors who look like me and who have lived like the roles that I have. And that has been huge for me to see a path forward. And now that I'm in a role that I'm comfortable in, in, in despite being green, um, <laughs> I can now help my peers and people coming into tech. And so like me and my friends um, at school, like at Cal especially, we reach out and we help with like different clubs and different organizations. and 
networking and creating this environment because I feel like, especially in tech, like there's still so much red tape and so much guarded knowledge of how to get in. And especially if you don't have like the social or cultural capital to know it, like you'll never be able to get in. And so I find it's like my responsibility now to help younger girls find a path forward and find a way into tech. Um, and just distributing that knowledge is the first step. This is maybe a very direct experience and very colored by my former role um, as an analyst at Forrester. Anything that I wrote belonged to Forrester, not to me. <laughs> so if I was going to cite someone else's work, it was kind of all in the company. There was never really, I mean, they were experts and you were known for your talks and for your expertise, but anything that you wrote or became content, like I've seen my reports be refreshed by other people. My name is no longer on them anymore. Um, and so there was no incentive to, to really point to folks unless there was a very specific um, question. Whereas now I'm in a role where my work is, can be referenced back to myself. And so if I reference someone else's work, I make sure that they're called out in it. It's just good research practice to cite where your thing came from, but to say, here's, here's an idea, or here's a slide, or here's a summary of this paper, and then to actually write where the paper is. Can someone go find it? Can someone see who wrote it? Are you saying who the researchers were? Are you saying where you're getting your information from? As a way to just continue to iterate that these are you're learning from other people and you're referencing their work. You're supporting their work by calling it out and calling them out by name, um, especially in, in, in an environment that can go look them up. And I think this, this can happen just from as you share content, but also I, I found that within maybe a smaller setting in a meeting, if you're brainstorming, people are coming up with ideas. I've really appreciated folks that have called people out by their ideas to build on it versus saying, oh, someone said this and I'm going to iterate on it, but saying like, oh, well, Sophia had, had brought this up and I think that, and then go from there. And just by even saying my name, I mean, it's, it's hard to do in big settings, but in just small conversations, it, it helps attribute those ideas back to the person. And even though they might only say one thing, if I've now referenced them a few other times in the conversation, they're still in it. They're still being recognized for the contribution, even though it might have just been that one point. So there, there are very small and scalable ways to make sure that people get credit for the things that they do. And even a small reference like that can help support someone who's new or developing to be seen, to be noticed for what they do. I think I think that's a good that's a good point. Um, uh, that's something like early in my career, like I had a couple of um, examples of like an idea, someone taking like a, a supervisor taking credit for an idea of mine, and so I feel like I've always been I've overcompensated almost in in a, like like I always you know if I have a conversation with somebody and then I'm talking about their idea and like I, I try to make sure that I'm crediting them you know yeah. even if it's like a like an obvious thing, like gravity exists, you know. <laughs> an obvious thing. I try to make sure that they get credit. Um, so that's a con. That's a, like just thing, day to day things like that as well. That's one way to offer support. Um, how many? Um, how many of you feel have ever encountered? Feel you've encountered in, unconscious bias in 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 how people have dealt with you. <laughs> Okay, quite a quite a few. Um, uh, if so, um, if so, um, the question for you, Colleen, you agreed to take this one. Uh, if so, how do you decide when to call that out, and what do you do in such situations? Well, <clears throat> this is an interesting story. Um, I arrived here Sunday, and upon check-in, um, everything was going great. Uh, a gentleman named Nicholas uh, went smooth. Uh, this was about, well, maybe 5 o'clock in the evening. Everything was going smooth, and then there was another gentleman that um, was standing right by me. And uh, he saw my mask. I had a sequin mask, because, you know, that's how I roll disco. <laughs> and um, he looked at me up and down, and it was just as I was uh, exchanging, you know, the uh, card. He's like, oh, I really like your mask. And he looked me up and down. He's like, you know what? There's this restaurant. You have to go. It's owned by this black man, and they have the best chicken. Mm. I says, oh, isn't this magical? I have to deal with this <laughs> today. And I'm like, first of all, that's I did, the unconscious behavior 
or bias is that we're, am I genetically predisposed to like chicken? Did he know I was vegan? No, did he ask? No, but do I have to waste my time and my, my mindset on that today? Because I was so excited to be there. But this gentleman, I mean, this clown, I mean, yeah, I'm gonna say it, he, he was a clown, um, just almost ruined my day. So what do you do if this is something in the workplace? I, don't, I did not plan on giving this man um, a, a lesson in you know, unconscious bias and please learn. That was not my intention. But what if it happens in the workplace? How do you, how do you handle it? Do you push back? And how do you push back? And what is your strategy? Do you manage, do you manage how they feel about you or do you manage how you feel about yourself? And how will the company thrive if you become your human self, but you're pushing back? Because when something, somebody says something that's not good and it's, it's unconscious bias, do you push back? Do you take that risk? Do you ruffle feathers? Do you um, prepare for the white flight? Or you hope on their side of things that they stay perched and they want to listen and they get that opportunity for the company's sake and for you uh, because you are a colleague. So they have your back. We've, well, I've been risking this for a long time. And I've been always looking for that culture that's more accepting. But I have to push back because if I don't, the behavior will continue. So when somebody says something like that, if they did say something like that in the workplace, you have to say, hey, you know, that's not really cool. Let's talk about this. But you're risking, will you be considered a troublemaker, you know, or hostile or whatever? It's, it's just, you are taking that risk. But will they listen? Will you be heard? So when we talk about imposter syndrome, I, I get it. But me being um, a black woman in tech, which I think, I mean, this might be controversial, but I really don't care. Black women are the least respected and have to give up the most. Women in general are the least respected in the workplace and have to give up the most. But for some freaking reason, black women are always down a little bit lower. And that's hard for me to accept because I know who I am and I'm a human and I expect people to take me for my work and not just who they think that I am. But if I don't push back, and when I say push back, it's not in a negative sense. It's just like, you, hey, you have to listen to understand. And let's talk about this. I'm taking the risk. Can they take the risk? Can they get over their fear um, or, or fear of being threatened? Take that opportunity. Stay perched. Listen. And do it when nobody's watching. Now, I love that everybody's diversity inclusion, and this is nice, but, I mean, come on. This is at the end of the day, and there's barely anybody here. I think it should be more important and we should be pushing back and making diversity inclusion number one, not at the end of the day with very little people here. And I think there was about six men here. And that's a conversation I wanna have. But, and I can have it aside if, if anybody's available. To, I, I, I have over 20 years experience in this. So I wanna have those conversations and I want people to not be afraid, especially what's been going on in the last year or so. You have to push back. If you're a woman, if you're non-binary, or you, I mean, you, you, you have, or, or they're gonna keep getting away with it. And it's not cool. Yes, you are risking something. You might risk your job, but you have to push back. I mean, well-behaved women seldom make history. <laughs> I mean, that's what I, my mindset. But um, yeah, I would ask, my strategy was to keep pushing back and see what happens. And, and, and encourage them. But I am not, I, I, I will tell you this, I am not managing anybody's privilege or fragility, not anymore. <laughs> if you are not ready, then maybe, you know, we need to have that conversation on whether I belong. But I am not having that conversation. I have enough to do. I can't manage white fragility and I can't manage white privilege. I have to manage who I am, my work, 
and I want you to thrive. And if you're my colleague and you're of my tribe, you will, you'll see who I am because you hired me. So, and I dealt with that in corporate, startups, just everywhere. And as you know, check in uh, <laughs> at KubeCon. So yeah, my strategy is to keep pushing back until, until something good happens. And I'm sticking with it. Thank, thank you, Carlos. <laughs> um, does, any, does anybody else have a th thought about dealing with unconscious bias and how to push back? I feel like pushing back is important and also educating and creating allies is also important so that you kind of have like a, a little brigade behind you at any point. Um, I was talking to Tammy, my boss, about this question and she brought up an experience she had when she was at Adobe and she was like with a client and the client was walking all over her and told her that a woman's place is, yeah, okay, first of all, anything that starts with a woman's place, it's not ever be said. <laughs> like, a woman's place is at home and, and everything else is extracurricular. So good for her, yeah. for her taking like an extracurricular activity and starting a career. And she was, fate, and she was with a colleague and he was a guy and he initially stood up for her and then this client just kept inundating her with his thoughts and eventually her colleague just put his face like in the plate and was just like, I, I don't know. Tammy excused herself and she initially had fought back and then just realize that it wasn't worth it, but also that like, she didn't know what to do, right? Like what, what are you supposed to do in that situation? She's representing her company, right? So like, is she supposed to just be a punching bag? And after the fact, her and her colleague had a conversation and he was like, I'm so sorry, like what should I have done? Like, what can I do for you? Like, what, how can I remedy this? And what should I, how can I be prepared for next time? Because there's gonna be an inevitable next time. Um, and she thought that was incredibly powerful and has been doing that ever since. Anytime she's like in a situation like that, then with the people around her, it's about educating, right? It's like, why is that not okay? And then what do you do and what can you say? And how do you fight back as a team? Because you obviously have more strength in numbers and men clearly know how to talk to men probably better. <laughs> um, and creating this brigade behind you, I think, is extremely important as well. I like the idea of a brigade behind, like oh, yeah. an, an army well, we of, gotta of, fight, you know? of your, from your, from your, your allies. <laughs> yeah, um, and brigade. that makes a good point, too, that sometimes it's not your organization that's the problem. Sometimes it's dealing with a, a client or a customer, or, yeah. you know, and, and, and the, the whole then economics comes into it. You know, you don't want to yeah. cost your company business or something, but. Absolutely, yeah. And it's important, not only for yourself, but if you see it in, within your, where you work or even outside, I mean, be that person that, I mean, you can't just, I hate to say victim, but make sure part of who you are and where you want to get to, especially if you're pushing back, is that you're helping others. When you see it, you don't just walk away. You see it and you say, you speak up. That ain't cool, dude. That is not cool. Let's have this conversation. And, and that person didn't deserve to, to hear that. But if you want to learn more, I'd be happy to do it. But stick up for your people, and your employees as, uh, um, especially. Yeah, especially these days, because they'll quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's great <laughs> resignation. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, so, I mean, we've touched upon this. Uh, I just want to see how we're doing on time. We're, we're Okay, left for, for so should, should we? Um, questions? Yeah, should we move yeah. to questions? Do we have questions? They're on the, if you want to write them down on the. Uh, yeah, yeah, if anyone's written. And then just bring them up. I can add an anecdote. Well, while we're, well, oh, okay. conversation while we're waiting. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, please do. Um, I was just going to say, I had two thoughts. One, I definitely want to plus one the brigade. Um, <laughs> I, I think I'm, I can be timid in uncomfortable scenarios, and I think for me what really helped was 
having a strong support system of peers where I could sit down with my other female colleagues and say, does this so-and-so's behavior bother you as well? <laughs> and see, is it not just you? Maybe I don't want to be the overly sensitive one, but like, if people are being uncomfortable, they might not always voice that. And so yeah. saying I'm uncomfortable in a smaller setting where other people are also like, I'm also uncomfortable. Now you know you have support. Now you know you have other people to lean on um, and to come and have your back when you want to speak up and say something about it. Um, on, on the flip side, in terms of addressing it and a, a larger uh, method, I, I found was quite effective and this really is dependent on the, the, the number of people, but we had an offsite of about maybe 70 people. Um, and we took an anonymous survey ahead of time about language and how to refer to each other and people and contexts. Um, and it was just a way for people to say, these kinds of language or to this type of behavior makes me more or less uncomfortable. Um, and then they shared the data back with everyone. So you know those were feelings in the room with you, but no one had to say, I'm the one who feels this way. It was done in a completely safe setting because they were removed from that, but they could still be completely candid with things that made them feel more or less uncomfortable. And then for other folks that would have never, I don't know, it's, it's really hard to confront someone when it's just like they're not physically harming you, but they're making you uncomfortable. Um, so to provide a setting to give that feedback and then share it with everyone so they know, oh, I'm not the only one who feels this way, or, oh, I didn't realize people felt that way about this language. And you hope that they change their behavior as a result of it, but mm -hmm. it's a way to also share it without putting someone on the defensive, too. If you confront someone and say, hey, what you said is insensitive, their immediate reaction is, is to be defensive because you've just attacked their character. But if you show it as, I mean, personal bias here, I'm a data analyst, if you haven't noticed. Um, I find that sometimes data can be that intermediary um, where it doesn't have any feelings, it's just the numbers. You're looking at aggregate across a number of people. Um, and so there's, there's no personal, there's no like personal stake in the game. You've now anonymized it in a way where you can take it as just an observation. I have a problem with the word defensiveness, especially even when you know you're not being heard. And you have to keep sometimes yell and say, hey, 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 that's not what I said. That's not what's been going on. I'm, I'm not being defensive. I, I just don't think you're hearing me. <laughs> I don't think you're listening. So yeah, I mean, that, unfortunately, sometimes that's what we do when we push back. We're you're being defensive. You're being or emotional. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, don't get me started <laughs> oh, with the emotional. It's like <laughs> at that time of the oh, month. There's yeah, <laughs> like uh, that's I've all. I actually it. had someone tell me that <laughs> in all my like 20 years of marketing. I'm like, dude, are you serious? Yeah. Yes, and it was a yeah. white male. So yeah. Well, well let's. Well, we're waiting for. Are we, how are we doing? With, Let's do it. I was thinking we'd do a little lightning round of common situations and, um, you know, how, how you handle it, what your tip is for handling it. Um, being interrupted in a meeting. No. Oh. <laughs> Anyone want to take you, you? I mean, this happens all the time. Yeah. You're, I'm, I think you just be like, and back to me. So, like, if there's anything I don't, I, I will be an idiot. I don't care. But I, and I also be that person that's like, and it's my turn now. And, like, I just bring it back to me. Like, you can interrupt me all you want, but I'm going to, it's going to come back to okay. me. <laughs> okay. And then just sort of fight for your place. And then, and then mm -hmm. I like that. Do you flip the hair? 100% flip the hair. It helps. A must. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. like to call it out when other people jump in across each other, like, oh, what, what, what were you saying, Colleen? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. just as a way to remind them that, no, she wasn't done speaking. So I think it's, mm -hmm. it's you can sort of stand up for yourself in the jump in, as I was saying, before you interrupted me. But it's also, I think, equally important for others in the room to just help make space for each other. Yeah, totally. And that was one of the questions that came up. Um, in our, in our, from our, our audience, so did that. Hopefully, that um, that answered. Also, we had the Kamala Harris. I'm speaking. That <laughs> <laughs> gave us all the strategy. Um, uh, so somebody said, uh, flip side in this, I encountered a colleague who was repeatedly harassed by a newly divorced man who was twice her age. It made all of us in the area uncomfortable, both for her and ourselves. However, she did not. Uh, want to report to HR or have anyone intervene? What would you do if, I guess, if you were in that situation or if you were, well, 
twice my age, they'd be dead, I think. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but uh, um, I guess if you if you saw that a colleague was this was happening to a colleague, would you be like, well, let her handle it, or would you? I mean, the whole business of reporting to HR too. I mean, HR generally works for the organization, not for yeah, that's the tough. employee, which sometimes people find to their to their dismay, you know. But I, I mean, think there's a difference when you, uh, yeah, HR stories um, when you go alone. But if you're going to like um, Crystal had mentioned, if you have a colleague, someone to back you up course, try and get that support. Because you'd be surprised that there's some, they might have had this similar you know, experience. But I mean, if they are alone, uh, just consider the risk. And um, you have to make that, that decision on your own. And it's not going to be easy. But at least you'll have it on file. I mean, we're going to get legal. <laughs> but that, that's what you, you do. I, I say do it. Do, I, I wouldn't consider, I mean, this is like downright, it's, it's like almost, it's illegal. It's like, it's abuse. Yeah. yeah. If, either way, if you were the person being harassed or if you were a colleague of the person being harassed, you'd go to HR? Yes. I think if I couldn't go to HR, I would ask someone on my team that was in those interactions, if, if I wasn't alone, to be like, hey, watch out for this, makes me uncomfortable. Can you just help me when this happens? And it could be like, yeah. let's go to the bathroom. <laughs> or like, uh, you know, like, that's disgusting, gross. You know, like, if you have someone else speaking up for you, it can be yeah. very helpful. Mm -hmm. Or just exit the situation. That's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Go to the next one. You want to ask yours? Well, to your first question, I would definitely push back. Because if you don't, then you're giving him permission to keep thinking it's OK. And yes, you are risking. But if, like we said, if you get people behind this, I mean, this is not a part of your job. It, it just isn't. Or have that conversation. Hey, I hear what you're saying, and, and you know, this is experience. But this is how I feel about it. Uh, I know that sounds, you know, but I mean, that's the first way you do it. And then the second way is like, I don't think you've heard me, but you've got to keep pushing back. And then somebody might hear you, like you said, um, a, another colleague, and they're like, you know, yeah, that's, that's not fair at all. And he might, he or she or whatever, might get the, the clue that, yeah, that's not OK. And they probably, nine times out of 10, know it's not OK. They just want to see. Is, is, huge narcissists probably to see how far they can push you. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing I would suggest is like, because um, in addition to pushing back, the, the, the danger is that you push back and then it becomes somebody else's problem. You know, some other woman in the office's problem or some other person's yeah. problem. Like one thing to suggest maybe is like, why don't we rotate this duty amongst the team? Like, you know, I, you know, this person orders food for this time and then the next person does it. Well, and, I mean, that's it just like saying, like, I feel like it's always my job and it's not my job, you know? Um, what is? I think sometimes pushing back is hard because you're, like, identifying, like, I have a problem with this and, like, you don't want to be like, I have a problem, right? Because then you're a problem. But sometimes I'm just like, you know, DoorDash does this or, like, Seamless or something like that. Like, offering, <laughs> like, like, you know, Domino's delivers. Like, what are we going to do here? Like, just like introduce a joke or something. I know it's like kind of not, you're not pushing back, you're not getting to the meat of the problem, but mm -hmm. it can be a good entryway into why the F are you asking me this? This is not my job, and I'm not here for you to walk all over me. Like, let's get Domino's or whatever. My <laughs> favorite is reprioritizing. 
you find what they really care about, and then you're like, would you like me to reprioritize that? Ooh. Order you lunch? Like, I can spend a couple hours ordering you lunch for sure. You want me to like, go buy it? I'll reprioritize your one. project. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was thinking that yeah. too, Crystal. That's good. <laughs> yeah, because I always, I always think of like, and I think of that maybe not just in this example, but anytime like someone asks you to do something, it's always like, okay, what am I going to not do? Because I have a full bookly book schedule. <laughs> so if you're asking me to take time out of my day, like, you're going to have to tell me what I'm not going to do for you. And it, it's one of those things where it's like, you force them back in the prioritization. How do they want to spend their employees' time? Um, and maybe it's, I'm, I mean, there are, I think maybe a mixed approach here potentially would be valuable, but I, I do agree with that as well. Because I think it's, it's very practical. You hired me to do a job, and by asking me to do something else, you're reducing my productivity. So is that a conscious decision? Mm -hmm. Like um, I, I want to follow up, too, on your question about the re remote. Because there are a lot of people that are starting jobs fully remote. Like, I'm meeting, our new stack team is here today, and I've met most of them for the first time this week in person. Um, and we've worked together for months. Um, so uh, yeah, so I mean, that's a, a, an issue that more people are dealing with. Do, you, do you, any of you have ideas for how to find support amongst other women in your organization when you're? I've been lucky to find meetups locally and globally, really. Um, I, I mean, I know they're out there, and especially now, because we don't really have a choice. But uh, yeah, find them, and they are super helpful. I mean, I do miss this networking, uh, but when you, I mean, you don't have a choice, um, and you can find some really, really good meetups virtually and remotely, and they can help you in so many ways, and you won't feel alone. Uh, somebody in Germany or could probably have the, the same issues or experiences that could help you and that, I mean, even though it's probably some, like maybe a different culture, but find them, they're, they're everywhere. As, um, if you, I would love to help if I could. <laughs> um, I started full remote actually a year ago at Arise um, and we didn't have, obviously like COVID was a thing, still is a thing, but even more so then. Um, and we weren't able to meet up or at all and everyone was scattered across the country. And, you know, I got a good gauge of the girls at Arise and then I started asking like, you know, guns a blazing questions. So like when I was negotiating my salary, I was like, what do you guys earn? <laughs> <laughs> and then we had like a great conversation about it and it in fact helped all of us. Yeah. Um, and we also developed like quite a bit more trust and there seemed to be like a lot more transparency and mm -hmm. just like understanding amongst all of us that we were helping each other. And it still is really difficult because we're still all scattered across the country and even across the world, but it takes quite a bit of proactive concerted effort to create that community. But it matters immensely to me and to my team so we put that effort in. Like we do lunches every two weeks, like a Ladies of Arise lunch. And we like have these side conversations and we talk about you know, femininity and we engage in conversations that matter deeply to us and it takes effort and it takes time away from you know, whatever else we're supposed to be doing for a rise. But it also creates this immense sense of transparency and solidarity that is immeasurable. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna add one more. Um, I, I'm a big fan of non-work meetings, <laughs> especially now during just to meet people. I think it's always the like, you have your meeting schedule and I, I like to have a productive meeting and sticking to the agenda, so like only five minutes of chit chat. But you're missing all of those side hallway conversations where you really get to know people. Um, so during the pandemic, I became a lot more proactive with actively scheduling coffee meetings and just like, just to meet people and say like, hey, you're on my team, we should have a one-on-one, -on -one. even though we don't have an agenda, I just wanna get to know you. Um, you can even bring questions like you would for a regular meeting, like tell me about your job, tell me about as much, I don't wanna say tell me about your personal life because people will share as much as they want to, but just, <laughs> Um, we used to do like icebreaker questions and just, just try to get to know each other outside of it. Because I think if you are only doing meetings for being productive in the meeting, we're missing all of that, all of the other connections. And so you have to generate it manually now versus just stumbling into it. Um, one, one thing that um, 
a little bit on that on that note. Um, my previous job at Container Solutions, um, one night we went. One time we did have sort of like a Zoom happy girls happy hour, women's happy hour. Um, of all of the and all the female employees were invited, and um, we we sort of just you know talked over it had like a talk over Zoom. Like I think we may have played like some online games or something, but it was just, it was nice. So it was just like, it was also like in the middle of the winter, the pandemic winter. So it was kind of nice to just have a, have a virtual, you know, party of sorts, but it was, it was good. It would, it really, um, it, you know, it did help bond us a little bit. So something like that, you know, organizing something like that. Oh, the activities are great. Yeah. Like one time we all just ordered each other tequila <laughs> That's a good idea. And then we played like telephone, but with drawing. I, I'm forgetting like the name of it, but it's oh, it's like a free. What was that? Is it Pictionary? It's not Pictionary. It's like on. It's it's some website. Crab something. Yeah 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 yeah. Oh it's oh yeah like a shot of tequila in that like you'll <laughs> you'll be best friends. <laughs> Um, another another question from the audience: How do you know what type of support to ask for um, that's appropriate? Um, like the vocabulary, the gesture. Like what what? How do you ask for support? Like how do you, um, as I guess, as a, in a mentor situation or just um, part of that brigade we talked about? How do you ask internally or yeah. externally? Yeah, I, it, d it doesn't say, but let's start with internally. Just ask. Because that's, is, this, is it that, I mean, I'm not sure, how do you ask by you? Yeah, I think it's more like how do you ask, like how do you? Do how you, do you approach the conversation? Yeah, how do you approach the conversation, what, what you know? How do you like know what to ask for? Yeah. yeah. Oh, one of the things that I, I've always, um, when I used to consult um, for friends looking for jobs, especially on LinkedIn, and I said, you know what, just put, you know, Put yourself out there, but when you do want to approach someone, um, don't ask them, hey, I need a job. Um, you know, say, hey, um, I noticed that this is you know, what you do. I'm looking for, for something um, within that field. How, how would you approach this? You, you make them like, oh, hey, um, this person thinks that my skills and my knowledge is pretty important. And somebody has asked me, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that I'm like in a second before you do the ask because it will make them once you you highlight their skills and knowledge uh, as a fan or a groupie or whatever, they want to help you. So maybe you have that type of approach by just just without just asking, hey, I need my mentor, I need you to mentor me because I need this, I need, I need, I need just just um, yeah, just just. Just talk to them about who they are and then give them the comp well the compliment and say, hey, this could help me with what I want to do and to develop and grow. I've, and it always works. Always. Yeah. I like the framing of reaching out to like a subject matter expert and then identifying the gaps in your knowledge and being available for having like a conversation that really dives into, you know what you need and how the other person can help you and then like how you potentially can reciprocate. Yes. Yeah. I would agree with that. I definitely feel like I've learned a lot from folks and just by reaching out to them as a source of information, you learn more about them as a person and how they got there. And so I think it's definitely about building a relationship. Um, I think it's hard to get support from someone who doesn't know you. So find ways to get to know each other. Um, I think for my last role, it was definitely a bit of volunteering for projects with people that I was really interested to learn from, mm -hmm. um, where sometimes there'd be an opening of like, hey, like I, I saw you're doing this, can I, can I help you with it? I, I've been thinking about something similar and finding for, basically identifying collaboration opportunities that allow you to get to know the person better. They work with you, they understand what you can do, and your relationship builds from there. So I think there's definitely this, the sense where you, Mentorship doesn't just happen overnight. It's definitely a relationship that you develop with people, and you might not necessarily know you're their mentor until later. <laughs> it just happened to me a few times where, I, in hindsight, I was like, "Oh yeah, she was my mentor," but like I didn't never really put that together because we were just working on projects together. 
um, but developing a relationship and support and trust between us. So I think just there's, there's an element of putting yourself out there, but also just asking, can, can I help you with something? Can I learn from you? And just to build a relationship. And uh, one more question. What can an organization do, the organization that you work for, any, any of us, uh, to prevent the biases that come up in day-to-day -day work? Acknowledge it. Have as many different kinds of people review something as possible. Because you might not see it because you wrote it. And even I've written things that later someone's pointing something out and it's like, oh yeah, that's a problem. And I just I was too in the weeds and couldn't see it. So just it's a little scary to share your things sometimes because it can be scary to get feedback, but it's it's always worth it because other people will see things that you don't. Okay. Um, is there anything else? Any other questions? Oh, one more. I'm sorry, could you could you speak up just a little bit louder? You can yeah. Yeah, that's He's trying too hard, kind of. <laughs> So you're, that you're sort of like treating, he's trying to, you feel he's trying to put you in a position of being like the, the you know, the, the word police or something like that or the. Hmm. Sounds like gaslighting to me. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, he's trying to make you responsible for his behavior. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's like dating. I mean, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not your. I'll keep saying this. It's not your job to manage his privilege. 
um, and to get validation from you, even though he says it, but oh, that's not what I mean. You, you, you know. No, you have to, uh, you, know, you can do whatever you want to do, but I would say you have to keep pushing. This is, this is not acceptable behavior. And if I do sound like I'm, you know, miss, you know, whatever, it's just because I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for the rest of my company because I mean, that's just not right. And you, we can't, it's tiring managing other people's privilege. I'm, I'm over it. <laughs> I really am. They have, I mean, they have to know how to act. I cannot hear you. I am so sorry. See, now, now that's, oh. that's gaslighting. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. I think he's plenty aware. Well, yeah. you kind of called it out too. It's like no other man acts yeah. like this. It's like straight. Like well, maybe it's worth just telling him. Yeah. No other man acts like this around me. Like that. This is bizarre. <laughs> yeah. 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 He could be just, like, not big on the social skills, you know? I mean, I think we kind of forget that sometimes. Like, some people are just not not good with... Yeah, but it's also not an excuse. Not an excuse, Thank you. but true, but... We can't manage their behavior. We yeah, I mean, if no other excuses. guy is, yeah. that you work with is like this, I mean, it yeah. could just be... Not, that doesn't make it okay, but I'm just saying... People's intentions, that's, I mean, that's interesting. Um, but again, you can't manage it. They have to know. They're grown-ups. They know. I mean, the world is, I mean, we're talking about it. You, you, there's no more excuses. You can hide behind your privilege after 5 p.m., go home, or you really want to work at it. Have the opportunity. Take the opportunity. Listen. Learn. And do it when no one's watching. I'm going to keep saying that. Don't do it in front of people just because you think you're a superhero and you're an advocate when you're really not. Just do it. And it, the, the perks of it when people actually, the culture uh, where I am right now, it just, it's, it's, a, it's a relief. I didn't use the F word, but it is a relief. <laughs> so any, any other questions? This has, been, this has been great. I mean, I feel like we've, gotten, had good, good questions, and, and I just want to thank our, thank our panel, Sophia, Colleen, Eleanor, Crystal, and thank you to Chronosphere for, for um, uh, sponsoring this and gathering us all together, and, and um, thank you for being here. Um, so after this, you just if you're welcome to, to network and talk and tell it, you know, share your own stories and and i'll be around for a while too as if anyone wants to to talk and uh thank you very much thanks for showing up thank you for showing up <laughs>